aperture. So I'm just going to spend the five uh, first minute just to give you, like, to explain a bit how I ended up in the Amazon. Um, and then I'll, I'll start to talk more about the project, the concept, uh, why I decided to work uh, on this jungle book. Uh, I actually grew up in the, in the Alps in Switzerland. And um, so the first thing I started with was uh, I got really interested in, in avalanches because uh, I was always afraid um, of avalanches when I, when I was a kid. I did a lot of ski, and uh, so I started to work with researchers. So it's better, yeah. So and uh, but I, my idea wasn't to 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 just work on descriptive pictures, but trying to find the kind of abstraction and uh, beauty um, in the avalanches. So for me, it was more like photographing, freezing the performance of a natural phenomenon. Um, and actually, uh, I started this uh, all ten years ago, and uh, I've been working on since since then. Like every winter, when I can, I try to to get these these images. Um, uh, but that's very something very different of what I usually do. Uh, I started with this, and I just keep going, trying to to get new forms every every year, um, but let's say that's my most um, abstract or conceptual work because usually what I really like is uh, live experience when I photograph and uh, tell stories. And so actually uh, one of my first story, and that's just an installation um, that I did uh, with, with the avalanches, um, I will pass, I will skip this on this because I, I have a lot of things to to tell you. Um, so once uh, I, when I decided to go down, that to leave the mountains, uh, I wanted to, to travel because I grew up in a village and there wasn't much to do there. And uh, the thing is, um, I, I really had no money to travel. And um, I was looking for like exotic places, but uh, without any money, you can't go far. And then I remembered, I guess you all saw this movie, uh, Straight Story from David Lynch. Um, uh, it's the story of um, Alvin Strait, who goes, uh, who wants to meet his brother and uh, does a road trip on the, on the lawn, uh, lawn morning. Uh, what? So what I did, I had this small moped and I went to the milkman in my village and bought his milk trailer and started my own uh, Route 66 uh, in my valley, uh, looking for adventure. So I had my camping, and then since I, I wanted to become, like I became a biker, I needed to have a, a, a style uh, that would help me to get accepted by the people I would photograph. So um, this is how the valley looks, and actually, um, you could think that it could be somewhere also in the US. So I started to look for places um, that were like exotic and with the, this moped uh, going so slow uh, helped me just to look at the landscape I was supposed to be used to in a different way. And then I also met on my road quite like many people who actually have never been to, to the US but somehow developed the kind of sense of belonging to the culture that they only knew in the movies through the myth. Um, it had nothing, they, they've never been, they don't even speak English, but somehow they, they liked the, the kind of lifestyle they saw in the movies and just tried to recreate this with, of course, like sometimes some Swiss attitudes. Um, some, and, and it created a kind of weird atmosphere. And so I actually started to gather all these images, and together um, I published a book like six years ago called Horizonville. Uh, Horizonville is actually the name of this gas station, and of course I also always try to have some references, and in this case, of course, uh, Hopper's um, paintings. 
But um, yeah, so that, that was one of the, the projects I, I started with, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because I have to move forward, but I'm happy to, to share some other stories with you about this. So after this, uh, I finally got some money because I was able to publish a book and, uh, and um, sell some prints. So I finally could leave my village and move in with some of my friends uh, in an apartment. Um, in this apartment, uh, we were able to build a mini ramp because we like to skate. And um, what happened is that my girlfriend uh, wanted to, to learn how to skate. So we, we started to skate together. But then she had to go to Congo to work for one year. And so uh, I said, well, let me come and visit you to Congo because we're going we're gonna to just have uh, some skateboard session. But then she told me, yeah, you know, there's a war going on there. It might be a bit difficult. So we decided just to go to the neighbor country, to Uganda. And there uh, we, we've actually met this guy, Jackson. And uh, uh, he told me, well, actually, um, I have built a mini ramp in my neighborhood. And... So actually, we've met the, let me see if I can find the picture here, the first mini ramp in East Africa, which was located in Kitintale, a working class suburb, really poor suburb uh, in Uganda. And they um, just were the, the first people who, who started to, to build a skate park uh, DIY. And uh, this was actually the beginning of the skateboarding culture in Uganda. I can see that Aperture has a print of this just here, in case you, <laughs> you want to purchase them. <laughs> and well, so uh, I, I started to document and, 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 and get interested the way like people also, um, like in Horizonville, uh, had seen something uh, on TV or in the internet and started just to leave their dream uh, at their home, actually, where they were able to trying to find a way to, to, to live and develop your sense of belonging, your, your identity as a skater, which is not like super easy, especially in Uganda, because you don't have access to all the brands, you don't have money for pur to purchase all this stuff. So there's a kind of um, very creative way to, to develop your sense of belonging as a skateboarder there. And so that's another small publication I did, like want to have a look later. It's right. So. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip this. Um, what brought me to the jungle is that before going to Uganda, I spent uh, six months in Brazil working on a reforestation program. And in this program, uh, I had to work, I, it wasn't in the Amazon, it was uh, in the northern part of Brazil. And um, I had to work with indigenous people in order to, to work on this, this program. But it was super weird because I came, was my first time, I, it was, I think I was 25 years, it was my first time I would go to South America and uh, also uh, I had like a lot of expectations, a lot of, um, I, I somehow like thought, wow, that's going to be like, I'm going to live, you know, with indigenous people, uh, I'm going to learn a lot about nature and what actually happened is that they were like me, uh, even worse, I would say. <laughs> they would go to the gym, they would uh, um, play football like anybody else, they would um, drink, go to party. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, I realized that like um, the only thing that they had as an indigenous was the idea of being indigenous. That means they were still talking about you know, like the white man came here, destroyed everything. Uh, the Indian, the, the indigenous guy, they would, he would just like to go fishing, hunting. Uh, but it was a kind of ideal that they themselves never really expect, um, experienced. Um, and so um, this idea of like having the feeling to belong to, belonging to something, but that at the same time you can't really, uh, you, it's just an idea of something that you don't even know if it has existed or not. And, well, the funny story, how it started, is that actually myself, um, once we went to a party, 
And so I had this expectation that like they would be like close to nature, and they had the expectation that me, like as a European guy, uh, would be somebody like you Grant in the Notting Hill movie, or that like you know like well dressed and everything. But myself, uh, I wasn't like this because I was working in the jungle, so I had just one pant, like walking boots, and. Uh, no haircut, beard, and there was a party like the in the village, and they came up, showed up, all were very well dressed, and um, <laughs> they looked at me and say, "Yeah, I'm seriously, you're going out like this?" And I was, oh, well, uh, uh, I didn't expect to really go out in this area, so this is what I have. So yeah, listen, sorry, you, you can't just come with us because look at you. <laughs> and so somehow, like the indigenous people, uh, I was thinking about like, yeah, the projection I had, like total, and they had actually another projection on me. And so they refused to take me to the, really like a like countryside party. There was nothing like fancy. And it was just like a concept of how things shall be. And I think mm, that might be interesting. That I think I, I have to work on this a bit. So later, I, I met this guy. He's called Almir Suru, Surui. And he's one of the most important indigenous leader. And uh, he came to Geneva, or, because I live in Switzerland, and there's the UN headquarter, one of the UN headquarters there. And uh, I met him, and uh, he told me about how uh, he was fighting uh, and for his land and his tribe, and that um, he had like a lot of. Uh, he was doing partnerships with Google, and uh, that uh, yeah, he he now uh, is like the the and how can I say like the indigenous like who uses a lot of technology. And this is the way he, he's really good at marketing himself and his tribe. Uh, he said, like, now we don't use um, arrows any longer. We use computers. And so he gets a lot of attention from the medias. And actually, he does this because, as you can see here, he's, like, uh, uh, threatened by a lot of uh, landlords. And uh, so he is under protection 20 hours a day, uh, 24 hours a day uh, in Brazil. So, um, actually, he, he told me all these things about, yeah, you know, we do a lot of things with, with technology. And I thought, wow, so that might be interesting. I'm going to come and, and, and visit you in Brazil. So I went there. And actually, it wasn't that technology. They were actually having a cell phone. And every, every um, like, 10 meters, they would, like, take a picture every day the same, at the same spot and see how things have changed. And it was more a matter of, like, I don't really know exactly. It was, they were just collecting data. There wasn't much about technology. But I thought something more interesting. Um, because, like, the, the, the history, uh, their history was that the first contact was in 69. Uh, and the, the, um, this was when the Trans-Amazonian, uh, the, the main highway, uh, started to reach their territory. And the first people who, uh, once the highway was open, were the missionaries. And this is how actually missionaries started to transform and change the indigenous culture. And here, I think something started to become interesting is that you can see this man uh, with his dress. Actually, he's the doorman of the um, of the church, the and and now he, the chaman now has left his practice in order to uh, become the doorman of the church. So I started to realize how culture was were shifting, and of course they were still hunting, uh, but somehow they had all these haircuts. And so I said, why? Actually, for five years, they, they've been having um, electricity for five years. And actually, they were all fond of this footballer, uh, Neymar. And so all the kids in the, in the village were having this, uh, this haircut. And so I think it was funny also because, like, actually, that comes like, from the Northern American. And uh, he uses it, and then he goes further to, to, to those guys. And so um, I started to think about um, 
a, a project that would tell all small stories about about the Amazon. And then I read this uh, this book, Francisco de Orellana's um, journey. Uh, Francisco de Ore Orellana was the first uh, conquistador who discovered the Amazon for, of course, the crown of Spain. And when you read this, bo this book, you realize how absurd the colonization uh, started. Or you you can you can see how he behaved when, with uh, with all the the people. And actually, this story um, really changed the the the, the world of um, South America because uh, we started to realize that you could. Uh, uh, go from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean through this river. So, um, I started to think I shall, I shall use this as, um, as a starting point and uh, follow this uh, path uh, of the previous um, expeditions in order to uh, find like interesting stories. And uh, I want to this, um, later, I will explain why why going to the Amazon and why mm, somewhere else. But of course, then you have all these topics that we all know about, like deforestation. And I wasn't interested in like telling the stories that we already know. So it's like taking the microscope and looking like for small little stories, uh, like in like bigger things like that. So of course. Like this kind of thing, there are mentioned in my book. That's, for example, one of my pictures. It's the same with uh, intensive agriculture. Um, of course, that's also one of the main issues for deforestation. Um, and then also uh, oil exploitation. But the way I wanted to, to photograph all these things were more, let's say, more in a poetic way. And also, um, the reality is much more complex. Uh, ah, this is how it started, the rubber boom. The, the rubber boom was, was quite um, uh, important and really changed the, the face of the Amazon because uh, this is when the, the, the colonization of the Amazon started first. So, okay, that's more or less the, the historical background of the, the place. But I was more looking for the the contemporary situation and some absurdity that would gather between all these cultural clashes. And actually, uh, we all have an idea of like um, a fascination of the Amazon because it's still like we have the impression that it's one of the only refuge that still e exists on Earth that we all like somehow, maybe you not, you not, but I got the feeling that you, 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 you have like the feeling that um, you come, you have like an origin and uh, that like in the Amazon there's still like a relationship between humans, animals and, uh, and vegetals. Uh, that's like also a new, new um, the new gold of the Amazon is the, the old building uh, dam everywhere and that's the Belo Monte Dam uh, upstairs in Brazil uh, and this is the way I photograph like hydroelectric uh, stories. That's like because this Waterfall is going to disappear, or at least not look like this, like in a couple of of months, because there's a dam constructed by Chinese companies uh, in front, um, upwards, upriver. But my idea wasn't to give a romantic, uh, romantic point of view of the Amazon, and neither. Can you still hear me? The the sound is okay there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. I just don't have. Um, I I didn't want to uh, the um, the uh, this area like in a romantic way or like in a dramatic way. Um, I think that's like um, super cliche in a way that like uh, shall we be like for development or against development? And I think like the reality is is much more complex. Uh, than this, because even amongst uh, people who live there, uh, there are a lot of uh, tensions. So I didn't want to 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 look like for like dramatic or spectacular pictures, but was more interested to tell, uh, yeah, some weird or um, stories that we we wouldn't like expect. 
And also, there's something that really, why I did that to go there, basically, is because I also wanted to learn a bit more about myself and understand more the, the connections that uh, losing maybe a bit some rationality. And I think that's the main difference between the work I did before and this one is that um, I, I started also to um, talk about maybe some fever dreams I had or some uh, myths or some readings I had. And uh, this, for example, is came like from like a read that I had, like an anthropological uh, reading from Ellen Klast, but that's also the kind of uh, image I had like in, in my dreams. So I, I took sometimes some the 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 liberty to to like create also like the pictures that like I I had in mind I had the sensation uh, um, that somehow I I experienced so it was more a kind of visual diary of my experience more than a straight like documentary and now how do you think about doing the project is basically my I shall I shall have uh, like some some references and I I always thought this project as a book first and uh, um, I was of course like influenced by the the original jungle book but the only thing is I didn't want to to tell like a very romantic stories but um, when when I started uh, to think about the book we we wanted to to use like this reference so if you you see the the book we we published we 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 we, we we were really influenced by by the design of of this book for the cover at least and then also all the map colonies of uh, the conquistadores uh, and and so i think that was also something that we wanted to 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 mention so um yeah that's the book and that's like the map we de we designed with like every time like some different like the stories were so at least people could follow a bit the idea but we started like from the Andes there where you can see that dam and the waterfall and then like following down the river the Amazon and then taking the Trans Amazon Highway the place so we started deep into the forest and the idea was to uh, leave it um, step by step until we reach the place where there isn't any forest any longer. So um, I'm gonna start the, to tell you some stories and why why I was so motivated to do this thing. Uh, just before um, I may just show you some installation shots that we did in Al uh, this summer. Um, the idea. Was can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, right. Um, we started to work on on big boxes, uh, and those boxes were like uh, references to like uh, the 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 transport that like the the material that is transported from the Amazon to Europe because the building was built at the same moment. Uh, as the rubber room uh, started in the Amazon, and this like marked like the beginning of the industrial industrial revolution in uh, in Europe, and so uh, France actually had like a very strong connection with uh, with the the Amazon, and we also wanted to create a kind of uh, totems and forest that you would like walk into and trying to find your way along all these uh, spirits and uh, images of, of the jungle. Okay, so as I said, like we start from the Andes and then we, 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 we follow the, the, the path. And of course, then you can see all this um, oil exploitation and then like images of forest, which is actually just a, a, a garden. Uh, this is the, a shaman that has like a garden of uh, medicinal plants. And so now comes like the, the, the interesting thing is that during this trip, you may uh, like encounter a lot of people 
And um, once I, I arrived um, here in this village, it took me like three days of navigation, and there was a graduation party. And this graduation party was super weird because there were like only three people graduating, uh, and there were 12 students. And everybody was having a lot of fun. Uh, the parents were totally drunk, but the students uh, were super bored. And they were well dressed like this, and everything was made for them, but they, 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 weren't, they did have no, no, didn't have any fun. So I started to talk to the teacher, and that's the teacher. And then, like after, uh, after I shot his picture, I asked for his name. And he told me, yeah, my, my name is Hitler, uh, Hitler Campinoa San Diego. And so at first I was quite... Uh, yeah, so, but the thing was, then I started, when I told you before at the beginning, uh, how like uh, the indigenous people were like, looking at me, right, oh, bet, much better, and, and uh, how I was looking at them, I started to think really, okay, like I'm super shocked, and I guess you all are shocked when you think, hey, how can you, uh, how, how is it possible that your name is, is Hitler? But if you think, for example, at least in Europe, if you talk about Pablo Escobar, it's, it's almost cool, or Manuel Norega, I don't know, there's a kind of thing that like, because we are, are, at least in Europe, we are totally disconnected to this reality. And we have the feeling that like, it's something that we only know that the guy was somehow powerful and that he uh, was like, uh, we don't really know what happened. Or of course, if you go to Colombia in Medellin, uh, people might, 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 might be shocked. But so imagine that like those people like, uh, when you live in the jungle, like that's like just this kind of foreign concept that is like super far, and it's like somehow maybe somebody in in Europe who would have like the name Pinochet was, yeah, why not? So for him, like or Hannibal, or in the past, like all these emperors, uh, um, Julius Caesar or uh, Alexander the Great, they all killed a lot of people too. But they're still, for history, they're considered good. So, of course, like, Hitler isn't considered as, like, a good person. But, oh, yeah. So, it's just that somehow if we flip a bit and have, like, another perspective, then at least it's just, like, it creates an absurd situation, but that somehow, like, makes, makes sense for them. Um, the same, uh, I went like on for six weeks on a modi medical boat trip uh, f led by the, Amer the Peruvian Marine. And what actually they did, they started to give antibiotics to people who actually didn't need them, but ah, you have like a headache or you have stomach problem, we have the solution, we give you antibiotics. And <laughs> they used to just take natural plants. So when you give an antibiotic to somebody, what happened is that they totally just get, like it's like giving them a, a drug or LSD or whatever. So this, the, it's super powerful. And so we were doing the census at the same time and there were like concepts brought from the capital to a region that wasn't like uh, ready for that. And so you have also another absurd situation is that now you have like kids who have the name of antibiotics uh, in the in the Amazon, for example, her name now is Ampicillina, because uh, the mother thought that the the antibiotic was a great thing and that like her daughter should 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 have this name. So um, also this like the the multi disquentos thing is um, it's actually there was a bank on the boat. And they were giving, like, uh, distributing those balloons to the kids uh, to promote a new program for the bank. And not, um, and you can imagine, this is like supposed to be the poorest area in the world for in Peru. They said, like, all these people did not have like any money. We have to bring development. We have to bring progress. But the thing is, you're doing this concept when you are in the capital in Lima, and actually. Of course, they don't have money, <laughs> but at the same time, they don't need much because they, 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 they are able to make a living. It's not that they are starving. It's not that they are living in a poor suburb. And so um, 
So trying to bring the bank and tell them to have a bank account like doesn't make any sense. And then you, you, you get like the bank distributing and promoting a new program called multi discuentos, which is like to get like discounts uh, with your credit card. So uh, to get like discounts in restaurants or travel voce. So you can imagine that when you are like at five days of boat uh, and don't have a bank account, you don't even understand what, what it is about. And uh, actually all this was brought there because um, there is oil uh, close to the to those communities, and that somehow the the, um, the government started to get interested in this area and wanted to like give something in exchange of what they planned to exploit. But of course, like they never like involve like local people, and so that's like part of the book. And also, um, they're al they're always. Um, the connection with 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 the animals that are always somehow like present uh, in in this daily life, and this is what I really like enjoyed and tried to to talk also about the the kind of poetic um, atmosphere uh, that we 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 have like in this this this, um, this trip, and um, here again is how like people start to play their own role as indigenous that means that like it seems like super weird and like as if it was a ritual and actually it indeed it was but the youngsters who are organizing those rituals actually totally forgot about the ancestors their ancestors the rituals uh, the language has been extinct already so they're trying to resave it but since they don't have like all the information they're creating like a contemporary culture of the amazon that means like how they just reinvent it and pretend to, and say to the kids, this is how our grandfather used to do it. But actually, uh, they, they, they don't have any clue. But since like identity like, is so important for the human being, I mean, we see it like nationalism is taking over everywhere uh, in the States, in, in Europe, whatever. So this idea of knowing where you come from and where are your roots, like it's super important for for human beings, and that somehow nowadays that like everything like goes like super fast and is like somehow globalized. Like even like the people in 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 any area try just to reconnect with with their roots, even if they have to invent them. And um, of course, like I try to do some references to like Werner Herzog, which is a great filmmaker I really like. Uh, as I said, the, um, the 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 idea of um, also mentioned sometimes uh, absurd uh, situation, but also uh, some uh, kind of uh, connections with uh, with animals um, and uh, and and myth. Um, once again, like how how you read, meet like weird characters along the the road, like uh, this guy who is like super famous in Colombia, uh, is known as the Colombian Tarzan. Uh, actually, he yeah he did some like he he sold Tarzan when he was twelve years old uh, in a cinema and decided to live in the jungle and live like a Tarzan. How like uh, as I said before. People try to reconnect with their identity. So, like from like a dancer that pretends that they are descendant of the Omagua people that are extended now. I'm not sure that the Omagua people would recognize themselves this way. And uh, of course, there's also a lot of drug trafficking. Um, and uh, yeah, that's like also a kind of weird stories that happen. So in the end, like. You 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 have also beauty contest. So everything like is influenced from abroad. In the past, nobody did like beauty contest there, but now it has to be. So there's a kind of party where you have all this uh, character from the Amazon. We talking about like a party about the jungle, about the the identity of the Amazon. But then like the beauty. Um, the, the girls that take part in the beauty contest, 
um, actually have like white skins because they are considered as the most beautiful women uh, in this area. You actually have beautiful uh, indigenous girls, but since they don't correspond to what you see on TV, to what you see in the magazines, they they're not like they're not considered as as nice as this girl, which is actually not that nice, but is still like Miss <laughs> Colombia. <laughs> For uh, it was like a, every town. It was at a triple border. So we have Brazil, Colombia, and um, and Peru. And each uh, town had his own representative. So you have like the nicest girl of the town of Iquitos and Leticia, uh, the town of Leticia in Colombia. And then what happens? The nicest, the girl that wins this beauty contest, like gets a super prize. She gets. Um, cosmetic uh, surgery so she can like be even the nicest girl of the beautiful the most beautiful girl in the amazon can look m more beautiful to look like uh, somebody that you would see on a reality show or uh, i don't know so uh, you could like go to bogota and get a cosmetic surgery to be even like more beautiful and this is how the kind of weird things that always uh, catches my attention is that um, somehow, where is our reference? Where is our, um, where is our uh, perception of reality? What is good or, or not? And then that's just a small portion in the book that deals about the, all what you can find in the, the forest. Actually, I, I've set up my own booth in the market in Iquitos, which is the biggest um, uh, market uh, in the Amazon. And uh, I went to every every little booth. Uh, it's not a booth, it's just that people come. They come, they all gather there. Uh, they take whatever they find in the forest, in their community, and bring them to the to Iquitos and try to 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 sell what, what, what they may think a good sell. So actually I had my own like little booth and went just to borrow all what I could find there um, and explain why why this was there. And uh, it's also uh, very different from what you would find in the supermarket. And uh, sometimes you just don't think, but why why just do you just empty the forest? Uh, wh what should I do with... Uh, well, the turtle, they eat them, but uh, sometimes there are medicinal plants. But uh, sometimes, yeah, you can really find, no, that's, that's useful too. I mean, but yeah, that's for example, the, the paca head. <laughs> they just actually ate the paca and still <laughs> maybe somebody would be interested in the head. <laughs> and uh, well, anyway, and then again, um, once again, I, I every every little um, I I try also to talk a lot about all these myths that we you 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 would find. So that's the story of a fish, and uh, I'm not going to tell all the story because it's super long. And uh, but you can also find all the story at the end of the book. We decided to to put an index with a lot of stories, but um, one story I still wanted to tell you because I think it's quite important to understand is um so that was the story i told before about the the this uh, trans amazonian highway that arrived in the community and what happened is that uh, the population decreased from 5000 to 300 within um 3 years so they all the suri people almost disappeared and then uh, while i was hunting with one of these kids uh, he told me this so the Suri, the Suri are polygamous, and but a man must marry her, his sister's daughter, his niece. Um, and then I said, "Well, but seriously, so you don't have any disease or problem?" And then he just tells me, "Well, we do, we have never had inbreeding problems. There is neither Down syndrome nor homosexuality among our people. These are the diseases of the whites, and as long as we don't mix with them, we will be protected." So it was a bit like Hitler. Uh, I was a bit shocked. I mean, not a bit. I was shocked <laughs> when you hear these kind of things. Like, wow. Okay, so <laughs> so that's like you. You consider like uh, homosexuality like uh, a disease, and of course, like I'm 
I'm not used to this kind of reaction. But um, then I started to, and first the thing, the first thing why I shocked was this, like the first sentence. But then again, you have to think about. That's also just a matter of perception, because what might be normal for you and what is acceptable uh, is maybe not for for other, and it's only only a matter of structure of a society. And in this case, they were like very close to disappear, and for them, like the way to survive was to, uh, if you marry with your with your niece, and uh, you you can keep going but of course like if you have uh, um, if you have an homosexual then it, it can't be accepted because you can't you can't survive this way so I'm not saying like he's right or he's wrong actually and not we are right or we are wrong but the thing is um, it's just always a matter of um, perceptions and how um, you 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 look at, at at the world and the uh, and 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 what is for you uh, acceptable or not what is reality for you and uh, i think that was the most important thing i've learned like in the in the in this work and i think for you guys like that might sound like super harsh and like super maybe negative um but at the same time i'm just trying to to explain that um, everything, every every reality is is more complex, and that like it always depends on on the point of view you have on on the things. So, all in all, um, I don't know. Like I could talk a lot about a lot of things about the way we we have. I don't know. Like as the conquistadors always had the kind of totalitarian. Um, uh, idea about the resources of the nature that sometimes we don't just can um, give like a value to what it is to just say like a culture is a value in itself or the or that um, just the biodiversity is just I important to because every time you have to explain yeah but it is important why is it important because it has to bring something and that's something sometimes I'm just thinking that like not sure that like it's a way to go but it's how like it has always been since uh, since we started to 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 leave Europe and and trying to to uh, conquest the world so um, I don't know what time is it because um, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So right. Okay. So uh, of course, like I try to gather uh, all these all, all these stories um, here um, about like uh, people who could like surf once a year uh, a river, but uh, in the past uh, it was considered as like something really uh, weird phenomenon, um, as also it's a myth, the myth of the Pororoca. And um, so slightly, like in this journey, we're, we're leaving the forest, now we're reaching almost the ocean. And then here, we totally left the forest. There used to be forest, but now it's just uh, where every... Um, it's actually, this is the place that feeds the world, or at least Europe, like chicken comes... Uh, the chicken we have in Switzerland, they come from this area. Uh, the corn, the soy, uh, it's in Mato Grosso do Sul. And that's a project that while I was working in Mato Grosso do Sul, uh, I, I met actually all these indigenous that were trying to gather, get the land back. Uh, actually, they, they had to leave their ancestral land because they were told that uh, they, they, they should go and leave to reserves. I think maybe you have this in the States also. But, and then they decided to go back and to take to take the land back, but the land is nothing else but just a cornfield. It's nothing. There's nothing there. And why would you like? Why would you need to go here and not here? It's the same. But for them, it's just another concept that you belong to one piece of land because all your ancestors and all the spirits are there, and um, that's like super important for them. So they try to build. They, they start to build these shacks and are like refugees on their own land. And 
in this uh, kind of refugee camp, I would I would call them if we're, uh, where where they live, uh, I met a lot of kids. They were like totally uh, like this, uh, wearing hip hop suits, uh, um, hip -hop and and were just like loving loving the the hip hop movement. And I somehow tried to understand how come that like Guarani are are so much fond of hip hop. And actually, uh, when one of the reasons is that they they first um, uh, want to be different than the the farmers, and the farmers they're really uh, the country countryman guys, and they wanted to 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 feel different. But also because, let me show you, there was one of there's. One of the yeah here we are, um, the um, is one of the the actually that's the first uh, indigenous hip hop band in a uh, rap band in uh, in Brazil and they come from this area and they they sing about uh, their daily life about what it means to be uh, a Guarani Kiowa and uh how like important uh the the culture is and uh so i thought it was quite interesting and when i met them i started to um i saw that they were quite interested in in taking pictures and so i said well why shouldn't we just do a video clip and um and they were quite interested in it so i started to do a workshop this is what I wanna I wanna maybe show you. La por ahí. Ara o ha 
massa, o peixe cheia, uma ou e a pa, uma ou e a pa. Right, and um, I think by by the beginning of next year we will be releasing their their first album also. So yeah, um, so yeah, what I actually really like is also um, getting involved and 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 work with the community. And it doesn't has to be only about uh, photographs. It's also about uh, I need time to. I need to spend a lot of time usually with people to just understand a bit uh, what I'm talking about. And I think that's usually what we, what I miss sometimes in the medias. Um, actually, I've, I've never was able to, to sell any of this. Um, I tried to, I all self-funded myself for this project. Um, never was able really to to get a magazine or no that's not true like in the end like the California Sunday magazine they did like a part in in the in Ecuador but usually uh the stories are too um are not like dramatic enough or are not like simple enough for for the medias and i realized that um i met a lot of people along the road uh when i was there a producer that would shoot a documentary within one week or photographers and actually they there's no space there were there was no space for surprise for them because they knew uh in advance what they wanted what they needed to bring back because they promised like even if the reality wasn't this at all they had to find a way to show it as it is because this is what they 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 sold to the magazine or to to the to the tv channel and uh often this happens is that like you go very fast you have a lot of uh, pre um, how do you say prejudice like a pre uh, like uh idea a precise idea without really knowing the place and then you always end up in this cliche always you end up in this idea of oh uh oh the amazon okay oh uh there's a lot of uh sad things going on like oh there is deforestation deforestation okay or oh, there's um oh these indigenous people they all live naked and we shall like uh help them to survive and actually uh from what my experience says is just that like everywhere in the world it's the same in africa like we have a lot of now it's changing slightly a bit because we fortunately we see also a lot of african artists that show like another reality uh that the reality that it is not always sad is not always uh um about poverty uh about conflict but this is just what usually also sells in in the media and uh, um, i'm just trying to to bring something maybe more like alternative and a bit more offbeat in in my work usually um and yeah that's uh that's actually uh, the the story of the the this jungle book so um thank you for attention and uh, feel free to ask any question i'm happy to to answer